Good morning. It's a real, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I just don't have words for um, how much I appreciate what happens in this amazing place and all the brilliant and committed people who make it happen. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about Abraham Lincoln uh, today. Whenever I, I talk about really accomplished uh, politicians, I, I do it with some humility because I really I make my career in criticizing politicians and carping. <laughs> carping from the sidelines, but uh, I had just a brief brush with practical politics myself, which very quickly brought home how difficult uh, a business it, it truly is. The head of the Conservative Party of New York once, this was years ago, more than 10 years ago, asked me to consider running for mayor of New York City, which was a perfectly dreadful idea. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I did, I did think about it briefly, you know, it was, it was flattering, and in this brief period when I was thinking about it, I got into the, the newspapers, and it turned out when I was living uh, up at uh, 14th in, in Union Square, there was one other conservative who lived in my apartment building, and she turned out to be a little crazy, um, but she, she was a conservative, and she buttonholed me in the elevator uh, one day and said, are you Rich Lowry? I was like, I am Rich Lowry. Are you, are you thinking you're running for, for mayor? I said, yes, I am. And she stopped me and uh, chewed my ear in the um, mail room and regaled me with all these fantastic conspiracy theories about the Clintons, uh, many of which you can find in my book, uh, Legacy, <laughs> Paying the Price for the, for the Clinton Years. And this conversation was going quite well. And uh, we were about to, to separate. And she said, but before I let you go, I, I really, I got to know what you think about rent control. And you know, as a conservative, and as anyone would know who's taken Econ 101, rent control is one of the great socialist boondoggles of our time. <laughs> and I was about to say this, and she said, before I could, she said, because I want to let you know, I live in a rent control department. And if you oppose rent control, you will never, ever get my vote. And this instinctive panic you know, gripped my gut. And I was like, what, what am I going to do? I was like, all right, I got it. You know, Rent control, I told her, is a very complicated issue. Uh, we, we'd, we'd have to uh, appoint a blue ribbon commission to study uh, the issue very carefully. Certainly, if we we're going to make any changes at any time, no matter how minor, we'd have to grandfather in everyone who currently lives in a rent control apartment. And she was very satisfied with this. I left, and I was, and I was walking to the subway, and I was a little bit like Barack Obama at uh, you know, the, the 2008 convention, or 2004 convention, I guess it was, you know, I got game, I'm LeBron, baby, I'm, <laughs> I'm good at this. And then I realized, no, wait a minute, I've been thinking about running for office for about 72 hours, and I'm already selling out. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's when I realized it was best left to the professionals, and I would just, I would just criticize from the sidelines. So uh, let, me, let me go just about um, you know, 20, 30 minutes here on Lincoln and the American idea and what he tells us about the American idea in my view and, um, and I'll draw out some uh, what I hope are some contemporary implications of this. Th this is really my, um, my foundational Lincoln text. It comes from something that you won't find and, and carved in marble anywhere but I really think gets at the essence of him. It's a little talk he gave um, in 1864 to the Ohio 166th Regiment. These were guys who were doing guard duty around Washington, D.C. for about 100 days. And they came to visit him at the White House. And he said, when I see troops, I really like to talk to them about what this war is about and why it's so important. And he told them that all of their sons one day might be able to live in this big White House the way my father's child does, which is a very strange way of putting it, but it's a way of avoiding saying the way I do. It's a little indication of uh, Lincoln's modesty at a fundamental level. But he went on to say, you know, this war is about free institutions and, and why they're so important. So he, he tells them uh, that we're engaged in this battle in order that each of you may have through this free government, which we have enjoyed, an open field and fair chance for your industry, enterprise, and intelligence, that you may have equal privileges in the race of life. The race of life, key Lincoln phrase, he uses it over and over again. With all its desirable human aspirations, it is for this the struggle should be maintained, that we may not lose our birthright. The nation is worth fighting for, 
to secure such an inestimable jewel. That is the essential Lincoln. And I want to talk a little bit about the hows and whys of that and, and tease out some applications. You know, even though Lincoln now is uncontroversial mostly and celebrated across the political spectrum from left to right, I do think he is in, in many ways still underestimated. There's a sense of him that he was just this uh, tribune of common sense and this accidental president. You know, James Russell Lowell said he was out of the very earth. Uh, Ralph L, uh, Waldo Emerson said he was the aboriginal man. All of this is complete <laughs> nonsense. There was uh, <laughs> nothing accidental about Abraham Lincoln, certainly not in politics. This was a highly, a highly ambitious guy. Pretty much the first thing he did when he left home and went on his own was run for office. He ran for office, you know, discount the presidential runs, in 1832, 1834, 1836, 1838, 1840, 43, 44, 46, 54, 55, and 58. And this is an extremely intelligent uh, man with an extraordinary memory that was noted from the very beginnings. When he was a, a kid, he would borrow neighbor's newspapers and return them and be able to recite from memory the editorials. Pretty much what any average National Review subscriber does today. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but people were really, they, they noted this um, at, at the time. And then finally, he had an extraordinary judgment about how the world works and about how people works and what motivates them. He used to tell a little story about how it's impossible to frighten people with uh, threats of far off punishments or to uh, positively motivate them with promises of far off rewards. And he told the story of an Irishman who stole a spade. He gets away with this act of theft. He's quite pleased with himself. And a friend uh, comes up to him and says in the politically incorrect argo of the day, well, Patty, you, know, you, you think you did a great thing stealing and get away, getting away with that spade, but let me tell you, when you go and you die and you meet your maker, you will have to pay for that spade. And the Irishman says, well, actually, if you're gonna credit me that long, I think I'll take another. Um, and, and Lincoln, the key to this judgment, um, to use a, uh, um, a terrible cliche, is he genuinely lived a life of hard knocks. There's a letter he wrote in the White House uh, after this incident um, where he, as we know, he loved theater, and he went to see a Shakespeare play. He's quite taken with this performer, uh, the main actor. He wrote him a letter critiquing his performance, talking about which Shakespearean plays he likes better than others, what his favorite monologues uh, are, and on and on. And like any good actor with, a, with an eye to PR, the actor realizes this is a good opportunity to get publicity for himself, so he leaks it and it shows up in the newspapers. And it's highly embarrassing to Lincoln, and people mock him over it. They say, look, you know, this guy can barely be our commander in chief, and now he's our theater critic in chief. And the actor came to realize he had abused Lincoln's trust, and he felt quite badly about it. And he wrote Lincoln an abject apology, and Lincoln wrote back, a note saying, well, you know, really don't worry about it. I've in my life, I've experienced a lot of ridicule without much malice and a lot of kindness not entirely free of ridicule. I am used to it. And every time I hear those words, it just stabs my heart uh, a little bit. So to understand Lincoln, you really have to go back to the very beginning where he grew up literally in the middle of nowhere in the middle of nowhere. When his family moved from Kentucky to Indiana, they moved to an area where the story was that just recently a young girl had been killed by a panther because her older brother wasn't able to kill the panther with the hatchet to the skull quickly enough. Uh, neighbors in another cabin would report that at night when they had their fire going, they would see through the chinks in the cabin the eyes of a bear reflected in the light. So this is a, a unforgiving environment. This is not suburban bliss. Lincoln's um, mother and um, her aunt and uncle died from something called milk sick. Uh, your cow would wander out into the forest. The cow would eat a poison weed, poisonous weed. You'd have no way of doing this. The milk would be poisonous. You would drink the milk and within a week would die a horrifying death. And that's what happened to Lincoln's mother when he was, was very young. He had to fashion a, um, 
a, a wooden coffin uh, with his dad and basically bury her in the backyard and there was no one there to give a sermon because there are no pastors uh, anywhere near there and she didn't get the funeral sermon until months, months, and months later when a pastor happened to be passing through. Lincoln said of this time and place there was nothing to it excite and ambition for education. His mother signed her name with an X. His stepmother, who was a, a dear woman and rec recognized his talent from an early age, was a great blessing to him. She signed her name with an X. He said of his father that he could barely bunglingly sign his own name. He told this to a campaign biographer in 1860. The biographer left it out because he thought it was so harsh, uh, but it was true. So this is the key thing to, to understand about Lincoln that people tend to forget. We call him the rail splitter, the rail splitter president because of this, this great act of branding when the Illinois Republicans made, made him their favorite son for president in 1860. They hauled out some rails from the back of the room, brought him up to the front where Lincoln was, and he's like, yeah, I probably split those rails myself. Um, but he did split a lot, a lot of rails when he was a young man, but he never wanted to split another damn rail in <laughs> his life. With every fiber of his being, he wanted to escape this backwoods existence. And for me, the key Lincoln story is one he told uh, about himself when he was in the White House. And he, he said how when he was a young man, he had a rowboat by the side of a river. And as he was idling there, this is a place where people would meet steamboats coming down the river but there wasn't a wharf. So if you can get out to the steamboat, you need someone to row you out there. So these two gentlemen come up in a, a carriage. They want to meet the steamboat. No way to get there. They say, hey, kid, can you row us out? So Lincoln says he helps them uh, out there, rows them out, gets their luggage up on the steamboat. And he says, this is decades later. He remembers this. He says, and as they're about to steam off, I said, hey, wait a minute. You forgot to pay me. And he says, to his shock and surprise, each of these guys threw a silver half dollar down on the bottom of the boat. And he said, I, I knew from that moment that I had earned my first dollar. And I was a more hopeful and optimistic being from that time. Lincoln wanted an America where you could earn a dollar and where you had to earn a dollar. And in a nutshell, that's why he didn't become a Democrat. Um, now, he was, he was surrounded, he was surrounded by Democrats. Everyone he grew up with worshipped Andrew Jackson, you know, the champion of the Democratic Party, the great Mars of the American uh, backwoods, and who, to be honest, was really a nasty son of a bitch. If you want to uh, imagine someone uh, with the, the personality of the late senator from Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, who is known as Snarlin Arlen, except for he might shoot you, that was Andrew Jackson. But um, <laughs> Jackson and the Jeffersonian Democrats before him, they worshiped the backwoods. They celebrated and romanticized the yeoman farmer. And I, I'm simplifying here, obviously. But their vision of America is everyone lived that life forevermore. We'd be a uniquely um, virtuous country. And uh, a, a Jacksonian journalist wants to capture the difference between the Democrats and the Whigs and then the Republicans at that time said that the Democrats are the party of the hardy rustics and the Whigs are the party of the lank, sallow accountants. And uh, Lincoln wanted to be with the accountants. And with every fiber of his being, he wanted to be with the accountants. There was no reason to become a Whig in Illinois unless it were out of principle. The Whigs never won a statewide office in, the, uh, in the, the state of Illinois. And Lincoln was truly a committed Whig. I mean, he was a fierce partisan. He hated uh, party switchers. There, there's a story about how he devastated an opponent in a debate once who uh, had been a Whig. He became a Democrat, kind of curry favor uh, with the establishment, got a plum appointment, and apparently did quite well with it because he had the only house in that era, area that had a lightning rod, which was like a key technological innovation of the time. The story is that this is the first time Lincoln had ever seen a, a lightning rod uh, on, on, um, on this house, and that the two of them were engaged in this, this fierce debate, 
and then Lincoln you know, brought up the, the party, party switching and said, well, I hope that I never have to erect a lightning rod to protect a guilty conscience from an offended God. Um, <laughs> So Lincoln, so why is Lincoln a, is a Whig? Well, it's, um, it has to do a lot with the economic program, which in a nutshell says we're going to have a cash economy. This isn't going to be a subsistence economy forevermore. So we need banks. We um, are going to have uh, industry in this country. It's not going to be an agricultural country forevermore. So we need tariffs to encourage industry. And finally, we are going to knit the country together in functioning markets and for that, you need these things that Lincoln loved, railways, canals, and steamboats. And just to understand very briefly just how transforma transformative railroads were. As soon as they touched an area, they just changed um, the way of life. You could be in a subsistence, um, you could be a subsistence farmer, and as soon as there was a railroad nearby, suddenly you would become a market player because suddenly you had access to cash. You could sell your goods to market, get cash for them, and then with that cash buy things in the East Coast that you never would have had before, you know, um, really well-made agricultural implements, clothes for you uh, and your wife. So farmers might stop even buying, start, stop even um, growing food for their own use if those weren't the most efficient um, foodstuffs for the market. So the railroads were absolutely transformative. And then there was a cultural element to this program, which was a, a real a key Whig and then Republican insight, which is that there's no sense in having a market unless you have people who are disciplined enough to take advantage of the opportunities to afford afforded to them. So the Whigs and the Republicans uh, maintained this strict ethic of self-improvement. And that, that was a key word for the Whigs. Improvements is what they called canals and railroads, you know, infrastructure projects at the time. That was the physical outer element to improvement. And then there was an inner element to improvement and always striving and making yourself better. And Lincoln was a, an evangelist and an exemplar of this ethic his entire life. Once he became a lawyer, aspiring law students would write to him and say, well, how, how do I become a lawyer? And Lincoln would write things back like work, work, work is the main thing. When his step stepbrother, who lived, continued to live on the farm in the backwoods and was consequently, consequently always short on cash, would write Lincoln these letters begging him for money, Lincoln would write back what I would assume were well-meaning but were really excoriating letters, saying to him, you are destitute because you idle away all your time. Go to work is the only cure for your case. Might have made for awkward Thanksgiving dinners, but, uh, <laughs> but there it was. So, and, and Lincoln lived by this ethic at a time when uh, America was soaked in alcohol, tobacco, and foul language, pretty much like any American college campus in this country, except for King's College. <laughs> uh, Lincoln didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't swear. He told the occasional off-color story but he didn't swear. And he told a story about himself, uh, about being on, on a railway car once with a Kentucky gentleman, and the guy from Kentucky offers him a fine you know, shot of whiskey. Lincoln says, no thanks. Offers him a fine cigar. Lincoln says, no thanks. Offers him a plug of tobacco. Lincoln says, no thanks. And finally, the frustrated Kentuckian says, well, sir, can I share with you a, a lesson I've learned through my long travels in life? And Lincoln is sure, you know, tell me, what is it? And the Kentucky gentleman says, he who has damn few vices has damn few virtues. And in that sense, Lincoln, he really had damn few vices. It was a time when casual cruelty to animals uh, was the norm, and Lincoln was embarrassingly tender-hearted towards animals. There's a story about Lincoln being out on the circuit when lawyers and judges would travel together uh, from county to county to hear cases, and this was a real rough-hewn male environment, and one day they're all riding out together, and Lincoln goes missing, 
And the guy who had been riding in the back with Lincoln, when he caught up, they asked him, well, where's, where's Lincoln? Where'd he go? And he said, well, the last time I saw him, he was chasing a bird's nest down on the ground. And when Lincoln finally caught up with everyone, they were all razzing him, saying, why are you wasting our time, you know, chasing around with these birds? And the, you know, this, this nest had fallen out of the tree. And Lincoln said, if I did not return those baby birds to their mother, I would not have been able to sleep tonight. There's a story about the, the White House having a cat and a visitor uh, going to a dinner. And at the dinner table, there was a chair next to Lincoln with the cat. And Lincoln was supposedly feeding the cat with the official White House flatware, <laughs> which as any, any married man would understand, outraged Mary Todd. And Mary Todd says to the visitor, don't you think it's crazy that the President of the United States is feeding the cat with our official flatware? And Lincoln piped up and said, no, 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 you know what? If this gold fork was good enough for Buchanan, it's good enough for Tabby. So, <laughs> so, what, so what, is, what does Lincoln do with this ethic of self-improvement? Well, he, he makes himself into a lawyer, as I alluded to earlier. And uh, at first, not much of a lawyer. There's a story a clerk told that apparently when Lincoln was a, a congressman for one term, a congressman in those days, you'd, you'd carry around seeds to distribute to farmers kind of as a, a favor. And supposedly, this office was such a disastrous mess um, and uh, that Lincoln had dropped some seeds in the corner and there was enough dirt for an actual plant to, to sprout up. I don't know whether that's true or not. But eventually, he makes himself into a, a big time lawyer. And this is, a, again, a simplification and a bit of an anachronism. But in, in one sense, he makes himself um, the foremost corporate lawyer in the state of Illinois, which does not accord with our image of Lincoln necessarily. It seems quite discordant, but it wouldn't have been for Lincoln. And again, this goes back to his fundamental economic views. This is someone who worships property rights, someone who worships the rule of law, someone who thinks if you have a functioning market, there shouldn't really be any class conflict, who was opposed to what we might call redistributionist economics. Uh, he famously said to a delegation of working men who came and visited him in the White House during the Civil War, let not him who was houseless pull down the house of another, but labor diligently to build one of his own. And undergirding all of this was a profound belief in the dignity of labor and the right to the proceeds of your own labor. Lincoln loved to quote Genesis, in the sweat of thy brow thou shalt make thy bread. Or as he uh, said more, uh, more informally, he who makes the corn should eat the corn. And he really thought any violation of this principle was an act of theft. And just to give you an idea how deeply he, he felt this, uh, he gave a, a speech once um, where he talked about how when he was a young man, his father would put him out to work, which his father could do until Lincoln was age 21, and his father could take the proceeds of everything he made. And this is backbreaking labor for other farmers, slaughtering hogs and all the rest of it. And Lincoln recounted how this was the case and said, I used to be a slave because I worked and someone else took the proceeds. Now that is obviously a self-pitying exaggeration, but it goes to his opposition to real slavery. What does he famously call it in the second inaugural? Unrequited toil. And Lincoln, he wrote these uh, wonderful, he was sometimes when he, when he was doing his writing, he'd write little notes out in, on scraps of paper while he was thinking of it and stick it in his hat. And uh, you have these little scraps, therefore, that never show up in any of his writings or his speeches that are little illustrations of points or, or logical proofs of certain points. And there's this wonderful um, little passage where he talks about how this principle is so basic to the world that even the lowest insect on earth understands it. And Lincoln wrote how if you find an ant and an ant has a crumb and the ant is working to drag the, the crumb <laughs> to its nest, and you stop the ant and try to take the crumb, the ant will fight you because it understands through its labor it now has a right to that crumb. <laughs> and if you, want to, uh, if you want to see a real world example of this, I think Lincoln is the foremost aspirational figure in American life. If you want to argue it, I think the, the, the best uh, uh, argument to that would be no, Frederick Douglass is. 
And if you want to see this principle really working out in someone's life, it's uh, Frederick Douglass, who when he's a, a slave, he has a, a very, uh, is in a household, it's a very nice woman who begins to read to him and teach him how to read. And uh, the husband says, no, you can't teach him to read because once he knows how to read, you will unfit him forever to be a slave. The light bulb goes off. Douglas, I'm going to do everything I can to learn how to read. He goes out in the street, trades food to the, with the white kids to get their reading lessons, learns how to read. Uh, he's in Baltimore. In, actual, in urban areas, there was more, some more freedom for, for slaves, and they'd be hired out to, to do work for others. And Douglas writes how he would work all week for his master someplace else. He would bring back what he had earned, and you know, it might be $6.00 and his master would let him keep six cents. But Douglas said that six cents he considered a concession, um, or, or as he said, I regarded it as a sort of admission of my right to the whole. So by the time he knows how to read, by the time he understands uh, that principle, this is not someone who's gonna stay a slave if he has anything to say or do about it, and of course he doesn't. But what we're talking about here is what scholars call free labor ideology, or what you might consider applied Lockeanism. So Locke, in a nutshell, you know, Descartes, the, the motto we all um, associate with Descartes, I think, therefore I am. A motto for, for Locke might be, I am, therefore I own. And uh, his, his insight, which does not strike us the least bit original or controversial because it's so in the fiber of uh, American thought and American spirit, uh, experience is that first I own myself, I have a right to myself, self, no one can take my life from me, and then through my labor I come to own things around me, like that ant. And Locke uh, put this in three words, we have a right to life, to liberty, and to estates. Now what does that sound an awful lot like? And it's because there's a philosophical plumb line that runs uh, from Locke into the founding and especially into the, the Declaration of Independence, which, to be honest, if you actually read the Declaration of Independence on a July 4th, which I recommend you do every July 4th, and you go through the series of indictments, it's a little tough on George III. Um, I, I, have a, I have a soft spot for, um, for George. They, they, they say when he began to go mad as an older uh, man that his first delusion was that he was George Washington, which, uh, <laughs> can you imagine the indignity? It's like uh, President Obama one day in his dotage waking up and thinking he's Dick Cheney, you know, so. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not the indictment, right? It's not the specifics that's most important. Most important is that glorious preamble where you get in, in a couple sentence, uh, sentences this timeless statement of truth about human nature and the purpose of government. And uh, Lin Lincoln got to this in a letter he wrote on the occasion of Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Uh, he, he wrote to a group of Republicans celebrating the birthday, I believe, in Boston. He wrote, all honor to Jefferson, to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document, which I think is a fascinating phrase, a merely revolutionary document, an abstract truth applicable to all men at all times, and so to embalm it there that today and in all coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Um, Calvin Coolidge, who gave perhaps the greatest speech ever on the, the Declaration of Independence on, the, on its 150th anniversary, spoke in similar terms about it. He said, uh, the Declaration, it's more than a mere secession of territory and the establishment of a nation. Events of that nature have taken place since the dawn of history. So you have both Lincoln and, and Coolidge uh, speaking slightingly um, uh, about um, the indictment and the Declaration because the main event is the principles, uh, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness, I believe very strongly, means what um, Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute calls earned success. It's work, it's effort, it's self-improvement. And um, 
the, the reason why Lincoln was such a determined enemy of slavery, slavery is because it denied this opportunity to an entire class of people. It took away um, from the black man, Lincoln said, in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the right of ever striving to be a man, which again is a very Lincoln sentiment. It's in striving that we become truly become uh, men and women. And of course, he considered slavery deeply violative of our principles. So that's why if you read his speeches in the 1850s uh, and his writings, it's steeped in this profound sense of loss because he believed correctly, I think, that the founders had tolerated slavery because they knew there was no easy way to get away, uh, to uh, uh, do away with it right away. But they didn't mention the word itself in the Constitution because they were embarrassed by it and they thought over time we would find a way to eliminate it. And Lincoln believed that that attitude had been lost, that uh, in the South in the 1840s and the 1850s, in the, the fire eaters, we see a new attitude to slavery growing up where they're no longer embarrassed by it, they're proud of it, they uh, celebrate it as an, a good institution, an institution from God that's good for the slave owners and good for the slaves. And for Lincoln, this just represented shameful national backsliding. And he would uh, write things and say things like, our Republican robe is, tra uh, is trailed and soiled in the dust. Let us repurify it and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the American Revolution. And for me, this should always be uh, the American project. How do we forge progress in this country by returning through the timeless principles that were put there like a stake in the ground by the founders for a reason. And I don't think we should sh share Lincoln's sense of despair, but we should have a certain sense of alarm about the estate of the American dream. And I'll, I'll just segue very briefly into some thoughts about our contemporary situation. I do think the American dream is in a kind of state of crisis. And the question for this country is not whether we're gonna be a rich country. We're, we're gonna be a rich country for a very long time, no matter how much we try to mess it up. It's not whether, whether we're gonna be a powerful country. We will be a powerful country, no matter how hard we try to mess it up, and we're trying really hard uh, at, at the moment. At times, I think the, the current occupant of the White House is a believer in this myth that all disputes can be worked out as long as you're sitting around uh, the table and everyone is well-intentioned enough. And the most extreme version of this myth was the Soviet Union, which believed in the brotherhood of man. And there's an old um, Soviet story about how in the Mas Moscow Zoo, they had an exhibit to show how this principle works in, in real life, in real time. So they had a lion and a lamb in the cage together to astonish uh, all, all visitors. And one visitor was indeed astonished and asked the zookeeper, well, that, this is incredible. How do you get a lion and a lamb in the same cage? And the zookeeper said, well, it's really not a problem. We just chuck in another lamb every day, um, <laughs> which, is, which is how the world really works. But the, the question is whether we'll continue to be a good country. Will we continue to be a country that's recognizably American? Will we continue to be a country where someone born in the middle of nowhere with some talent and some pluck can make the most of himself? And I don't think we're doing um, so well uh, by that measure. It's, uh, I don't think it's necessarily uh, income inequality. I think the people who obsess over that issue never really uh, deal with a couple things. One, the fact is that trends towards um, increased income inequality hold across all developed Western nations, no matter what the tax or the, the labor laws are. So this is a very deep and, and broad a trend. Second, they never really tell us what the harm is of inequality. As we've all been sitting here uh, uh, in, in this room, perhaps uh, enjoying a sandwich. Mark Zuckerberg has been getting rich, richer than every single one of us. So, in, so income inequality has literally increased the last 40 minutes. But does anyone feel any worse about themselves? Or has any harm been incurred by anyone? Maybe. Does anyone feel, it's okay, you can say if you feel. feel it. Is it bothering you? Is it really bothering you? Um, but I think the, the, the measure we should focus on isn't in inequality, it's mobility. And the question, can people who start, the, start at the bottom get out of the bottom and up to the top? And by some measures, we're doing okay on this. You look, you look at the bottom fifth 
of the income distribution. You're born there, you get a college degree, you have an 84% chance of getting out of the bottom fifth, 17% chance of getting to the top. It's pretty good. But you just look um, at, in the aggregate, you, if you're born in the bottom fifth, you have a 40% chance of staying there, which is twice of what would just be merely chance. So we are sticky at the bottom as the social scientists say it. Conservatives like to pride ourselves in this being the greatest land of opportunity and mobility in the world. Well, it's not necessarily true by some measures. They, they, um, there's you know, debate over, over all this, but at least by some measures, other English-speaking countries have more mobility than we do. Scandinavian countries have more mobility than we do. And I really think this is the issue that both parties should be focused on. I would commend to both of them a, uh, in broad outline, a Lincolnian program of how do we create the greatest possible market dynamism, how do we enhance opportunities for education, and how do we forge as much as we can a return to what I would call the bourgeois virtues, which don't require reading the Bible. They're not Bible-thumping things. They're very basic ingredients to success, showing up at to on time, being disciplined, having a job, getting married before you have children. And these, these are, are the virtues that are being lost. They've been lost at the lower end of the income scale. They're increasing, increasingly lost in the middle. And I, I think this is a, um, a serious situation. Then over time, if current trends could continue, it could become quite dire. So I'll just leave you with one, one last Lincoln quote. When he was a young lawyer, long before anyone had heard of him, he gave what's called the Lyceum Address. There's a famous passage in there where he talks about how even then, when the United States was quite young as a nation, it was really invulnerable to military assault. He said, you can take all the armies in the world, you can put the greatest general in world history, Napoleon, at the head of that army, and it cannot take a step on the Blue Ridge Mountains or a drink from the Ohio River by force of arms. Then he goes on to say, if destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its author and its finisher. And as a nation of uh, free men, we either must live through all time or die by suicide. And I submit to you that we should all resolve to live, and we do it by uh, returning to our founding ideals as reflected by Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much.